Before we start today's PMQs, I would like to remind members of the service which is being held at St Margaret's today at one o'clock to commemorate the 40th anniversary, the end of the Falklands War. I hope as many members as possible will be able to attend. I'd also like to point out that just a minute. <laughs> I'd also like to point out, not this sign language, that the sign language interpretation of PMQ proceedings is available on Parliament Live TV. Now we start with questions to Prime Minister Mike Wood. Question number one, sir. Yeah. Prime Minister. Mr. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Mike Wood. Government support for households is greatly appreciated, but high energy costs are also causing massive problems uh, for businesses and particularly energy intense manufacturing. Yeah. Will the Prime Minister support the repowering the Black Country Initiative, backed by the left and by Andy Street, to reduce reliance on fossil fuels? And will he meet with me to look at how the Black Country can be a pilot project to decarbonise? reduce costs and protect, uh, protect the region's manufacturing jobs. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I thank my honourable friend that he's a great uh, champion for Dudley and the, for the black country and in addition to the £1,200 uh, for the 8 million most vulnerable households that we're providing £400 to help everybody with the cost of, uh, of energy, Mr Speaker, we're supporting the black country uh, with cost efficient energy infrastructure and uh, the region has already received £1.5 million to develop a cluster plan for decarbonisation. We now come to the Leader of the Opposition, Keir Starmer. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, can, I, can I pay tribute to all those who served in the Falklands? My uncle was among them, serving on the HMS Antelope when it went down. Thankfully, he made it back, but too many serving in that war didn't and we remember them all. Yeah. Mr Speaker, Britain is set for lower growth than every major economy except Russia. Why? Yeah. Prime Minister. Mrs. Mrs Speaker, well, I'll, I'll, I'll tell him. Uh, Mr Speaker, actually, uh, we are going to have, according to the IMF and the OECD, we are, in addition to the fastest growth in the G7 last year, we're going to have the second fastest have the second fastest this year, and we will return to the top of the table, Mr. Speaker. But the reason, Mr. Speaker, uh, other countries are temporarily moving ahead is, of course, because we came out of the pandemic faster than they did, and because we took the right decisions to come out of, to come out of lockdown, which he opposed, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and that's why, right now, Mr. Speaker, we have the highest number of people on payroll employment on record, Mr. Speaker. Mr Speaker, he always likes to blame global forces, but global forces are just that, global. Everybody faces them. Britain isn't, isn't under crippling economic sanctions like Russia. No wonder he doesn't want to answer the question, why is the UK set for lower growth than every other major economy? Why? Prime Minister! Uh, Mr Speaker, I, 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 think, I think everybody can see that I've just answered the question. Once, once again, once again, he's, gu he's guilty of what uh, my legal friends call ignoratio elenchi. He's failed, uh, he's failed to listen to what I've actually said, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, what would be useful in supporting the UK economy right now would be if, he, if the leader of the Labour Party ended his sphinx-like silence about the RMT strikes coming up in the course of the next couple of weeks. Uh, will, he, will, he now, uh, will he now break with his shadow transport secretary and denounce Labour's rail strikes? He's in government. Oh. Look, just to remind the Prime Minister, he seems to have gone. It's Prime Minister's question, it's not opposition question. He's in government. He could do something to stop the strikes, but he hasn't lifted a finger. I don't want the strikes to go ahead, but he does. He wants, Mr Speaker, he wants the country to grind to a halt so he can feed off the division. And as, as, 
Mr Speaker, as for his boasting about the economy, he, he thinks he can perform Jedi mind tricks on the country. <laughs> These aren't the droids you're looking for. No rules were broken. The economy is booming. The problem is the force just isn't with him anymore. He, th he thinks he's Obi-Wan Kenobi. The truth is he's Jabba the Hutt. Last week, last week he stood there and boasted that we would continue to grow the economy. This week, it turns out, the economy shrank for the second month in a row. Yeah. How does it help Britain to have an ostrich Prime Minister with his head in the sand? Yeah. Prime Minister, there he goes again, Mr Speaker, running, running this country down uh, when, uh, when everybody... We've got, we've, got the highest, we've got the highest employment... Highest empo Prime Minister, employment. Look, I want to hear the questions and the answers. And uh, whether you like it, but I genuinely believe it, the public who watch it also want to hear both. Prime Minister. I mean, Mr Speaker, we've got lower unemployment than France, Germany, Italy, Canada. Uh, we've, got the, we've got the highest number of people in payroll jobs, as I've just said, uh, 620,000 more since, uh, since records began. Uh, and he might like to know this, uh, that just in the first five months of this year, this country has attracted, I think, £16 billion of investment in its tech sector. Uh, he doesn't like these European comparisons, let's make it for him. Three times as much as Germany, twice as much as France, Mr Speaker. He should be talking this country up, not running it down. That's the ostrich. Yeah. He's not just denying how bad things are, he's yeah. actively making things worse. Yeah. His 15 tax rises are throttling growth, and the director of the CBI is so fed up, he's reduced to saying, can we stop Operation Save Big Dog and move to action stations on the economy? Yeah. Now, Mr Speaker, we know what the Prime Minister says about British business in private. Yeah. I think that's pretty unparliamentary. But when did screwing business turn from a flippant comment into economic policy? Yeah. Well, um, Mr Speaker, look, I, just, I just reminded the House of what's happening in, uh, in Tech Week, uh, in this country, the massive investment that's coming in, uh, helped, by the way, by this 130 per cent super deduction for business investment that my right honourable friend, uh, the Chancellor, has put in. Never forget, Mr Speaker, uh, that labour, under, under Labour, taxes go up on businesses and on people. Uh, we're, cutting, we're not only putting £1,200 more into people's pockets, we're having a tax cut worth £330. He talks about taxes. £330 on average for everybody who pays national insurance. Labour have already made spending commitments in this Parliament alone worth £94 billion more than the government has been. That's £2,100 for every household in the country, Mr Speaker. No wonder no Labour government has ever left office with unemployment lower than when they came in. Mr Speaker, 15 tax rises and we're sat for the highest tax burden since rationing. He says the economy is booming when it's shrinking. He's, he's game-playing so much, he, he, he thinks he's on Love Island. <laughs> Trouble is, Prime Minister, I, I'm reliably informed that contestants that give the public the ick get booted out. Yeah. And it's, it's not just low growth, he's also lost control of inflation. He was warned about this last September. And what did he do? He dismissed it. He didn't act. He sat on his hands. Now prices are through the roof and we're set to have the highest inflation in the G7. When will he accept he got it badly wrong when he claimed that worries about inflation were unfounded? Yeah. Yeah. Minister. Mr Speaker, we're helping people with the cost of living uh, with £1,200. Uh, on the 14th of July, the money will be going into people's bank accounts. W why can we do that, Mr Speaker? Because we have the fiscal firepower to do it, uh, because the economy is in robust shape, uh, with record numbers of people in payroll employment, uh, Mr Speaker. And that is thanks to the steps that we took uh, that he continuously opposed. And if he wants to, and I just remind Mr Speaker, he has a chance. I won't, I won't say this interrogatively, Mr. He has the chance now to clear it up. 
uh, he can oppose the Labour's rail strikes right now. Say, he, can, he can disagree. He can disagree. And give him that opportunity. Let him disagree with the union barons who would add to people's costs in the coming weeks. Mr Speaker, I don't want the strikes to go ahead. He does so he can feed on the division. And, uh, Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, they're, ma- they're making a lot of noise now, but I've got a long list here of what his MPs really think of him. Drag, dragging everyone down. Who, who said that? Come on. Who would have said that? Authority, authority is destroyed. Come on, hands up. Which of you was it? Which of you? Come on. Can't, can't win back trust. Anybody owning up? You're very quiet now. Hands, hands. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, my my personal favourite, my personal favourite is this. This is a document, cir- document circulated by his backbench, in which they call him the Conservative Corbyn. Prime Minister, I don't think that was intended as a compliment. (laughs) Week after week, week after week, he stands there and spouts the same nonsense. The economy's booming. Everything's going swimmingly. The people should be grateful. But whilst he's telling Britain that we never had it so good, millions of working people and businesses know the reality. Britain's growth is going to be slower than our competitors and our inflation higher. A Prime Minister who sounds totally deluded, totally failing on the economy, oh, no. failing to oh, tackle... Oh, oh. I think we need to get to the end of the question, but in the... <laughs> but I'll just remind you, I will hear the end of the question in silence. Any more noise in this corner? There'll be another cup of tea early if we're not careful. Yes, <laughs> A Prime Minister who sounds totally deluded, totally failing the economy, failing to tackle inflation, failing to back business, failing to help working people through the crisis. And, Mr Speaker, his big idea, go back to imperial measurements. He's got 80s inflation, 70s stagnation, now he wants 60s weights to complete the set. When is he going to ditch the gimmicks and face up to reality that under him Britain's economy is going backwards? Let's see the Prime Minister. Prime Minister. A couple of quick points about uh, Mr Corbyn, uh, right over the Islington North. Uh, first of all, he tried repeatedly uh, to get him elected as Prime Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker. Se- secondly, speaking, speaking from the experience, uh, the, he's, relatively, he's relatively dynamic uh, by comparison uh, with the right honourable gentleman, uh, Mr Speaker. Dynamic and coherent. It might be helpful if you speak to me. I'm struggling to hear because of the noise on both sides. So please, if you, if you, if you, if you look to the chair, it'll be easier for both of us. But what we're going to get on and do, Mr. Speaker, is continue to take the tough decisions to take this country forward, and uh, decisions that are on the side of the British people, Mr. Speaker. Uh, they're, they're blatantly on the side of the RMT union barons. When, when there are some ticket offices that barely sell one ticket per hour, uh, Mr Speaker, we are on the side of the travelling uh, public. Uh, by the way, he hasn't mentioned this, but they're on the side of the people traffickers who are risk people's lives at sea, Mr Speaker. And we, we are on the side of people who come here safely and legally. Safely and legally, Mr Speaker. They carp and snipe from the sidelines. That's what, what they've always done. We take the big decisions to take this country forward. And no matter how much welly, no matter how much welly his right honourable friend, the deputy leader, may ask him to apply, it doesn't matter how much welly he pretends to apply, when that welly, Mr Speaker, is always on the left foot. Many areas like mine have already had massive new housing development with no commensurate increase in general practice. Sorry, 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 sorry. Point of order. The Honourable Lady's been here for so long, she should also know that points of order can only come at the end. Sandra, Sandra. Oh, dear. 
many areas. Have a conversation later, but certainly it's not. I'm just here. Many areas like mine have already had massive new housing development with no commensurate increase in general practice capacity. In one of my surgeries, with double the recommended number of patients per GP, a bowel cancer diagnosis of a 51-year-old father of four was missed and is now terminal. Getting this right is a life and death issue. So will the Prime Minister make sure that areas, that parts of the country that have already had massive new housing growth get the commensurate increase in general practice capacity that is only right and fair? Prime Minister. Uh, yes, Mr Speaker, and of course uh, we've increased the numbers of uh, doctors by 6,000, another 1,200 and more GPs since uh, this time last year, 11,800 more nurses, but we must make sure uh, that areas, particularly where uh, areas of, of, of new sensitive development is going in, uh, that uh, there are the infrastructure services, particularly medical services, uh, that they need. Uh, the NHS has a statutory duty to take account of population growth. I know he's met my old friend, uh, the Health Secretary. I will take it up personally uh, to make sure we get a proper approach uh, to, I think, a, a very, very important uh, issue. Ian Blackford. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And can I join you and others that are remembering today the Falklands conflict of 40 years ago? And those like my colleague Keith Brown, the Scottish Justice Minister, that served there. And in particular, our thoughts are with those that paid the ultimate sacrifice. Yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, yesterday our First Minister started a national conversation yeah. on Scotland's yeah. right. Yeah. 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 right to choose an independent future. When we look at nations like Iceland, Ireland, Norway and Denmark, it is clear that our neighbours are outperforming the United Kingdom. They deliver greater income inequality, lower poverty rates, higher productivity, social mobility and business investment. Mr Speaker, the list goes on and on. The evidence is overwhelming. Scotland is being held back by yep. Westminster. Countries can use the powers of independence to create wealthier, fairer, and greener societies. Why not Scotland? Prime Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, I don't, I don't uh, doubt uh, my, my right honourable friend's talents as a conversationalist, uh, but I think there are other subjects in the national conversation right now, uh, and, and they include, uh, Mr. Speaker, what we're doing to come through the aftershocks of COVID uh, with the strongest jobs-led uh, recovery uh, of any European economy. As I said, 620,000 more people across the whole of the UK, uh, Mr Speaker, in payroll employment than there were before the pandemic uh, began. Uh, and uh, I think another subject of, of national conversation is investment into our whole country, investment in Scotland, investment across the whole of the UK, as I mentioned already, in the tech centre. And the whole of the UK standing strong together on the international stage and sticking up for the Ukrainians. I think that's some of the things that the country is also talking about, Mrs. Speaker. Prime Minister. Yes, stronger together. Has the Prime Minister seen the pound? I think the financial markets are giving their judgment on this Prime Minister. You know, Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister can afford to live in his own little world, his own little Britain. But people have to live with the reality of a failing Westminster system. A cost of living crisis worse in the UK than any other G7 here, country. Here, here. An inflation rate double that of France. Here, here. The second worst economic growth forecast in the G20 next to only sanction Russia. And now a threat of a trade war with our European friends triggered by a law-breaking Prime Minister. Yeah. That is not a vision for the future of Scotland. Our nation is big enough, rich enough and smart enough. Yeah. Isn't it the case, Prime Minister, that Scotland simply can't afford to remain trapped in the failing Westminster system? Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, yeah. stop the world. Scotland wants to get on. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I think that uh, the, the, the figures speak for themselves. The UK has uh, record numbers of people in uh, payroll employment. That's an, that's an astounding thing uh, when you consider where we were during the pandemic. That was because of the UK working well together, as he will remember, with the vaccine rollout, uh, with the testing, which Scotland uh, and the rest of the country cooperated brilliantly. And, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, he, he talks about a trade war. 
He talks about, it. He talks about a, tr a, a, a trade war. What could be more foolish, Mr Speaker, than a project that actually envisages trade barriers uh, within parts of the United Kingdom? That's what we're trying to break down. Craig Tracy. Thank you, uh, Mr yeah, Speaker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, during the Jubilee celebrations, I was honoured to share part of them with Cohort 4, an inspirational mentoring and support group who provide life-changing support to a wide range of women, such as those who have tragically been the victim of domestic violence, sexual abuse or suffer from mental health difficulties. Sadly, as a result of the panic, pandemic, the need for these services has only grown. So would the Prime Minister join me in thanking Beverly and her team for the incredible work that they do at Cohort 4? and set out what more government can do to support these organisations so they can continue to deliver the vital care to vulnerable men and women across all of our constituencies. Uh, I thank my honourable friend. I want to, I want to uh, extend my thanks also to Beverly and everybody uh, in cohort four for what they're doing. There's the extra support that we're giving uh, includes £140 million pounds of funding for uh, victims' uh, services uh, and £47 million ring fence, particularly for organisations uh, such as Cohort 4. Uh, thank you to Cohort 4 uh, and, uh, and similar organisations for everything uh, that they do. Ed Davey. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I join the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition in paying tribute to our armed forces and sending our thanks and gratitude to the veterans of the Falklands War and their families? Mr Speaker, millions of families across our country are suffering because of the cost of living emergency. And people in rural areas are especially hurting, bearing the brunt of record fuel price rises. The Rural Fuel Duty Relief Scheme is supposed to help by taking money off the price of petrol. But some rural counties aren't eligible, like Cumbria, like Shropshire, and like Devon. <laughs> Mr. Mr Speaker, the Conservative Party is one to hear ideas to help those people, and I think the people of Devon will note. Because there are families and pensioners across rural counties who are missing out on this support. So, Mr Speaker, as petrol prices soar, will the Prime Minister accept our idea to help people in rural counties and expand rural fuel duty relief? Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, we cut fuel duty uh, for everybody across the country by record sums. Uh, he talks about pensioners, Mr Speaker. We're giving uh, £850 more uh, to every pensioner across the country. And uh, he talks about the cost of energy. Everybody is going to get another £400 uh, to help them uh, with the costs of energy. And uh, the, the, great, the, the blissful fact about uh, the Liberal Democrats, Mr Speaker, is people don't actually know what their policies are. And, uh, they're, they're able to go around the country. They're able to go around the country, bamboozling the, the rural communities, uh, not revealing that they're in fact in favour of massive new green taxes, Mr. Speaker, which is, what they, which is what they want, and not revealing that they would like to go back straight away into the common agricultural policy uh, with all the bureaucracy and all the costs that that entails. They don't say that on the doorstep, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. There are proposals for up to 10,000 housing units on flood-prone greenfield sites uh, to the west of Ifield in my constituency that would also represent intolerable pressure on local services. Can I have an assurance from the Prime Minister that as we update planning legislation, we will enshrine the brownfield principle first for new developments and save our environment and our services. Prime Minister. Uh, my old friend is completely right and uh, we encourage the, the use of suitable uh, brownfield land and our policy is for brownfield first everywhere and always. Thank you Mr Speaker and the Prime Minister will know from my recent correspondence that my Kirkcaldian Cowden Beath constituent Ruth Zuccarello is the sister of Jim Fitton who is pre currently imprisoned in Iraq uh, and sentenced to 15 years for collecting some shards of pottery. Um, uh, the judge passing sentence did not believe that Mr Fitton had any criminal intent and this has obvious and significant implications for Jim and his loved ones. So I would ask the Prime Minister if he would be willing to meet with me and other MPs who have constituents uh, in Jim's family to discuss this case so that we can work in concert to uh, 
resolve some of those issues. Yeah. Well, I, I'm really grateful to the uh, Honourable Gentleman for raising Mr Fitton's case, and I have a great deal of sympathy, I must say, uh, with him. I'll make sure that he gets uh, uh, the, the right, my, right Honourable Gentleman get, gets a meeting uh, with the relevant minister as, far, as soon as possible. Thank you, Mr Speaker. One of my youngest constituents, little Nellie Oakshot, is two years old and has been diagnosed with metachromatic leukodystrophy. Her very brave parents, Megan and Tom, are supporting a campaign to see MLD added to the newborn blood spot test. Had that been included in the test, Nellie's condition could be treated. Now the family are squaring up to palliative care and planning to make every day count. Will the Prime Minister give his support to add MLD to this Hillprick test so that families in the future can be spared this same heartbreak? Yes. Uh, I, I, I thank her very much and I know that the thoughts of everybody uh, will be with uh, Nellie and her parents Tom and, and Megan in a, 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 a very, very difficult time. And uh, what I can tell her is that uh, the, the National Screening Committee has received a, a request uh, to look again at the uh, conditions for uh, doing an MLD test, and that is currently being uh, reviewed uh, right now. But I will make sure that she gets a meeting as soon as possible uh, with the relevant minister. Liz Twist. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, in just five days, rail passengers across the UK and in the North East will be facing huge disruption. But on the eve, on the eve of the biggest rail dispute in a generation, it's emerged that ministers have not held any talks whatsoever since March. So Mr Speaker, I ask the Prime Minister You've done out. You've I asked the out. Prime Minister, has he met with trade unions and employers in the rail industry to attempt to bring this dispute to an end? Yeah. Yes or no? Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, I, I, noticed, I noticed that what the well, one, union, one union baron was asked about this. He said, I don't negotiate with the Tory government, uh, is what he said. That's, that's, that's what they said, Mr Speaker. We all, know, we all know how much money the Labour front bench take from the RMT, Mr Speaker. We know, we know why they're sitting on their hands uh, in, during Labour's rail strikes. They should come out and condemn it, Mr Speaker. Come, Thank, you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Today is Pension Credit Awareness Day. Pension Credit is currently underclaimed. Around a quarter of those entitled don't claim it. So all my right honourable friend, uh, join me in encouraging people in Gedling and throughout the country to check their eligibility, uh, make that claim, so we can get uh, more money into the pockets of pensioners. Yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, it's a very, very worthwhile and important campaign that my honourable friend uh, supports. Uh, too many pensioners fail to take up uh, their entitlements under pension credit. Uh, it can be worth another £3,300 a year, and the more we can do to make pensioners aware of it, the better. Anna Macmore. Thank you. Why is it that the worst people often rise to the highest office and stay there? Not my words about the Prime Minister, but those of his newest appointment, his cost of living czar. <laughs> Families across Cardiff North, crippled with skyrocketing bills, unable to afford even the most basic necessities, all agree with him, saying this Prime Minister has to go. So if his own czar doesn't even have faith in him, tell me why those struggling should. Yeah. Yeah. Prime Mr Speaker, uh, she's asked uh, that question repeatedly. Let me uh, just remind her uh, that uh, this is a government that gets on and delivers on our promises to the people, and in particular uh, getting Brexit done. I read, I read the other day, Mr Speaker, that she wants to go back into the single market and into the customs union. I think she, I, that's, if that's the real policy of the Labour Party, Mr. Speaker, uh, going back into the EU, then why won't the shadow, uh, why won't the leader of the opposition admit it? Robert Timpson. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. 
When our family adopted my two brothers in the 1980s, support for adopters, whether that be financial, therapeutic or professional, was minimal. And by the time I became a family law barrister in the late 1990s, it really wasn't much better. Uh, efforts since, particularly the Adoption Support Fund from 2015 onwards, has improved the situation. But as ever, there's much more that we can do. And to that end, would my right honourable friend look at making self-employed adopters eligible for statutory adoption pay so they can also have a better and fairer start to family life? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I, I thank my uh, honourable friend and he's a great champion for, uh, for adopters and all those who uh, help give uh, children a, a loving and stable home. Uh, we, we've so far focused on supporting, he's quite right, we've focused on supporting uh, employed uh, parents, uh, but local authorities do have the power to provide discretionary payments equivalent uh, to maternity allowance for self-employed adopters as well. Gary McCarthy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. We know that at times of economic hardship, suicide rates are likely to rise too. We saw that after the 2008 crash. So as well as doing more to support people through the cost of living crisis, will the Prime Minister commit to doing more to support excellent suicide prevention campaigns like CALM, the Campaign Against Living Miserably, and also implement Labour's pledge that anyone in need of it should be able to access mental health counselling within a month and then to waiting lists? Yeah. 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 Prime Minister. Uh, she's, she's entirely right, Mr Speaker, and we must uh, focus uh, ever more on mental health. That's why we're putting another uh, £2.3 billion into supporting mental health services, including uh, suicide pre prevention and the, the many wonderful uh, charities that help uh, people uh, with, their, uh, with their conditions, Mr Speaker. Uh, and you know, what I can say is it would be a good thing if across the floor of this House uh, we had support for the spending that we're putting in. David Jones. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The conflict in Ukraine and the consequent disruption of the supply chain in wheat uh, has highlighted the need for the United Kingdom to become more self-sufficient in food. The Genetic Technology Bill, which has its second reading this afternoon, will help create the conditions to enable English farmers to uh, produce more food of higher quality. But does my right honourable friend agree? that the drive to self-sufficiency requires a UK-wide effort, and will he urge the devolved administrations to adopt the provisions of the bill so that farmers across Britain can produce the food that the country needs? Prime Minister. Uh, my honourable friend is completely right that apparently the policy, of course, uh, the bill only applies to, to England. He's completely right, but in a, in a, in a loving and sharing way, in a, lo in a loving and sharing way, we are going to work with uh, the devolved administrations, uh, Mr. Speaker, so that the whole of the UK can uh, enjoy the benefits. Very yeah, 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 yeah. Mental health support is vital for victims of sexual crimes. When a Rotherham survivor, who's here today, reported her childhood abuse to the police. They told her not to go for counselling, as it could be used against her in court. Yes. Your Attorney General is challenging the rules, so it's even easier for defence teams to access victims' counselling notes, mm -hmm. having an immediate chilling effect. Yes. Survivors shouldn't be forced to choose between their mental health and justice. Yes. Yes. Prime Minister, please stop this. Yes. Yes. Well, I'm very interested to hear what she says, and I will look at the, uh, the evidence that uh, she has. But uh, I can t and the these are very sensitive and very difficult issues, uh, particularly as regards uh, the, the defence uh, cases. Uh, but if she looks at what's happening, for instance, on uh, rape and serious sexual offences, where we've had very similar problems, uh, we are starting to see gradually an improvement in the, in the prosecution rates. And that is because governments across, de uh, across departments across Whitehall working together to take account of victims' needs. And I, and I, I, I agree that progress isn't everything that I would like, but we are seeing progress. My right hon. Friend may be aware that the Shrewsbury and Telford Hospital Trust uh, has recently submitted a revised outlined business case in support of its £312 million capital allocation made by the Department of Health four years ago. Does he agree with me that in order to make progress and complete the ho ambitious hospital building programme, the NHS decision-making processes not only need to be levelled up, they need to be speeded up? Yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister. I, I think, uh, Mr Speaker, that uh, the, the right honourable gentleman certainly uh, speaks for uh, many in this House in, in wanting faster decisions on 
uh, planning in the NHS. But what you also, and, and that's what we're, uh, we're doing, we're pushing through, as he knows, uh, 40 hospitals uh, by the. Uh, by 40 hospitals uh, we are building, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and uh, what that needs is the funding. And uh, I, I just tactfully point out again, the opposition benches are bellowing away. Uh, they voted against the extra £39 billion, uh, that we're putting in. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. My constituent, Mr Singh's identity, has been stolen. His NHS records are being misused, but he's been advised there is nothing the Health Secretary can do. Crimes are being committed in his name. The Home Secretary's Department assured him that this would not affect his immigration straight status. Yet recently, he, his wife and children were detained by UK Border Force whilst travelling for a family holiday. Can the Prime Minister explain who in his government is responsible for this chaotic incompetence? Mr Speaker, I'm, I, I'd be only, only too happy to look at the... And I'm very sorry for the, the experience that Mr Singh and his family uh, have had. And, uh, and, uh, and I should ask who's responsible. I'm responsible, Mr Speaker. And I take, but I will look at the case. Uh, I'll make sure that she gets a proper answer uh, from, uh, from the Home Office in the Immigration Department. Theresa May. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My constituent, Dominique Davis, is the niece of Dom Phillips, the British journalist missing in Brazil alongside the Indigenous expert Bruno Pereira. Will my right honourable friend ensure that the Government makes this case a diplomatic priority and that it works to do everything it can to ensure that the Brazilian authorities put the resources necessary to uncover the truth and find out what has happened to yeah. Dom and Bruno? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I, I thank, her, I, I thank her, my, my right honourable friend very much. And I can tell, uh, I can tell her that uh, for, for representing the niece of, uh, of Dom Phillips, and of course, like everybody in this house, we're deeply concerned about uh, what may have happened uh, to him. Uh, FCDO officials are working closely uh, now with the Brazilian uh, authorities following his disappearance on the, on the 5th of, of June. Uh, the minister responsible uh, has raised the issue repeatedly. Uh, the search and rescue effort with uh, Br Brazil's justice and Public Security uh, Minister, and what we've told the Brazilians, uh, Mr. Speaker, is we stand ready uh, to provide, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, I should say, to, to, we stand ready to provide all the support uh, that they may need.